Okay, well, I'll start with the housekeeping just and people can keep going through. So, um, hello and welcome to the first of this um, season, semesters, um, USIHS um, seminar series. Um, obviously, we have moved from Prony to online, um, but we have two more papers um, in this uh, seminar series, um, which I will give you information about at the end. Um, for now, what you um, should know is that um, you've all been muted on entry um, and this will be videoed, uh, recorded. So if you don't want your face showing up on the recording, please uh, turn your camera off. Um, we will have a Q&A after Annie's talk. Uh, so there is a chat at the bottom. So if you could put any questions in there, uh, we will get to them at uh, the Q&A. I think that's everything I was meant to say, but if not, I will add everything else into the chat. Um, but for now, I will pass over to the president of USIHS, Trevor Parkhill. Thank you, Sophie. It's my pleasure to welcome you and the speaker, Annie Tindley, to the lecture, uh, initially to be given in Prona and now online. Um, the title of the intriguing title is uh, the economic management stroke mismanagement of uh, landed estates in 19th century Ireland. So um, we're all agog, Annie, if you want to take it from there. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks very much, Trevor. And thanks to you and to Sophie um, for the invitation. I'm absolutely delighted um, to have received it and I'm just so sorry again that I can't be delivering it in person with you all um, at Prony um, so sorry about that but thank you for moving me online uh, anyway and um, let me just share my screen um, because I have some pictures you'll be pleased to hear <laughs> um, lovely yeah so um, thank you again very much um, um, to the society uh, for the invitation um, and also I'd like to thank Prony um, for the hosting um, of this evening but also for their um, support um, over the past I think 10 years that it took me to to do this work on the first Marquis of Dufferin and um, which was obviously um, um, I suppose very much dominated by the D1071 collection uh, held in Prony so thank you um, to them uh, and I'd like to say a final thanks to my father and mother-in-law, Joe and Janet Campbell, who are here this evening, um, who put me up for the best part of 10 years when I came over to research the project too. So I hope this isn't too um, disappointing a result, <laughs> Joe and Janet. Um, so um, as, as where most of you are, um, I think, um, in North Down, let me just, uh, in North Down, um, is the Clandy Boy, once the Bally Leedy uh, estate, seat of the Blackwoods, uh, Barons and later Marquises of Dufferin and Ava. Uh, Clandy Boy House is just a few miles from the edge of Belfast Loch, only 10 miles from the industrial, now post-industrial, imperial city of Belfast. And many of you may be familiar um, with this statue, um, which is in the grounds of the imposing Victorian Whitestone City Hall, a kind of remarkable example, I think, of the kind of flamboyant statue of a great man, uh, which the late Victorian and Edwardian public excelled in producing, and really the sort of urban landscape of Britain is littered with these kinds of statues. But even by the usual standards, this particular monument is almost comically ornate. The focus, the first Marquis of Dufferin and Ava, stands in court dress under a stone umbrella, his honours, including the Star of India and the Order of St. Patrick, displayed proudly on his chest. This extraordinary piece of public commemoration, injecting a visual reminder of Belfast's place in, in and contribution to the British Imperial project. A note is when I, I always come and visit it when I'm over in Belfast, but it's generally ignored by passers-by <laughs> uh, and visitors. And I think that's because the world that it invokes has receded from public view, having once been a source of immense local pride and global emphasis. Here we have a local landowner turned colonial governor and diplomat at the heart of imperial affairs and the European courts. 
So this evening, I want to discuss those local routes, uh, the Clandy Boy in County Down and its management or mismanagement, uh, as the title indicates. And I really want to, to look at that in the wider context, firstly, of economic management of estates in, in Ireland more broadly, but also in Scotland uh, and England. And secondly, into the context of aristocratic decline, um, which is kind of a, a general trend facing that class as a whole in Britain, but especially in Ireland uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I guess what I'm really interested in is that period, the 19th and 20th century, we see an, an acceleration of the professionalization of estate management and land management. But how was it that so many Irish estates did not perform financially uh, to meet their owners' needs and expectations? I want to ask what part did cultures of investment and consumption play in this? And what were the political as well as the economic uh, results? But firstly, though, a brief introduction to Lord Dufferin. Um, so this is Frederick Temple Hamilton Temple Blackwood, the first Marquis of Dufferin and Ava, born in Florence in 1826, son of a relatively minor but, but sort of solid Ulster landowner, Price Blackwood, um, of Scottish uh, descent, and Lady Helen Blackwood, an artistic society hostess and granddaughter of the famous playwright Richard Sheridan. Indeed, Lord Dufferin would attribute his wilder characteristics, or rather his troubling ineptitude with finances, as due to his Sheridanish inheritance. Uh, Dufferin was educated at Eton, that traditional hothouse for the ambitious aristocrat, a path confirmed when he went up to Christ Church, Oxford, in January 1845. Now, he was in a prominent position as a young undergraduate, having inherited the Clandy Boy estates in 1841 due to the sudden death of his father of an opium overdose on the Liverpool to Belfast steam packet service. This was due to the era of a chemist in Liverpool rather than anything more sinister, but it did mean that Dufferin became a landowner in his own right at the relatively tender age um, of 15. Um, his estates were taken in hand by a group of trustees until he turned 21 in 1847. So as such, he had oversight of his estates for close to six decades. He dies in uh, 1902, early 1902, um, including some of the most challenging in Ireland's history uh, and politically uh, for the Anglo-Irish elite class that he belonged to. So he spent much of the 1850s and 1860s in London trying to build a political career and was very active in the Lords. He never sat in the Commons, of course, um, but he was very active in the Lords on behalf of his party, the Liberals, and in attempting to influence Irish land reform in this period, writing pamphlets, drafting his own bills, and trying to influence William Gladstone, his chief, away from what he called his irritating ideas about Ireland. Overseas service, however, um, removed him um, from the increasingly fraught nature of Irish issues in Westminster, uh, something for which he claimed later to be grateful. Um, so he started off in a number of relatively minor positions, such as the Under Secretary of State for India, um, again for the War Office and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, until his appointment uh, in 1872 uh, as the Canadian Governor General. So Canada was followed by spells as a, as a diplomat, as an ambassador in Constantinople and Russia and Egypt, before he took the top job of Indian Viceroy in 1884. After India, he was ambassador in Rome and Paris before his retirement to Clandiboy in, in, late, in the late 1890s and his death in 1902. But first, let's go back to the mid 1840s. Um, Dufferin, raised and educated predominantly in England, did not fully uh, make his mark on his estates until he reached his majority in 1847. On that preeminent occasion, he held a dinner, um, as reported, for 500 tenths uh, and made a speech on the outlook for an Irish landlord. It was not good. The outlook was an individual who does not get any rent, a well-dressed gentleman who may be shot with impunity, the legitimate target of the immediate neighbourhood, a superficial index, by which to mark the geographical direction of the undercurrents of assassinations. 
Dufferin was being semi-facetious when making this speech, presumably to his uh, not too sympathetic tenants, but there was truth in the humour. His social circle at Eton and Oxford had shown him what real wealth looked like, uh, and even a cursory glance at his own estate finances would have shown him that they were never, given his own personal ambitions regarding uh, politics and elite and literary society, they were never going to fully support his expectations. So what did he inherit? The total acreage of the estate in 1847 was just over 18,000 acres, which was not contiguous, but spread across three areas, Clandiboy, uh, Ards and Killyley. Um, during Dufferin's minority, the estates were under the primary supervision of one of his guardians, the Honourable Reverend W.J. Blackwood, um, and by Arthur Reed and John Howe, who were the resident land agents. Naturally, a cautious approach to estate management was followed during those years, and no major improvements or expenditures were undertaken. But one worrying trend was the growing proportion of arrears of rent. These stood at £2,400, or just, just over that amount, in 1841. And that figure continued to increase by a rate of nearly 5%. In a summary commissioned by the trustees in order to impress upon the young Dufferin the limitations of his particular inheritance, the auditor noted that average yearly arrears totaled just over £2,000. These were significant and suggest a problematic structural issue relating to rentals on the estate, leaving aside for the moment the impact of the Great Famine, which I'll come back to um, in just a moment. To put that into context though, the average um, annual expected rental of the estate was £18,770 or thereabouts with a few shillings and pence. Um, although this was topped up um, from other cash sources such as investments to a total annual income of 21,000 and £700 per year or thereabouts. So an income of over £21,000 is obviously very respectable for a young landowner, although lower, much lower than the incomes of his patrician wig social circle. And um, when we look, for example, um, at um, the Dukes of Sutherland, um, his great friends, um, we're looking at annual, you know, multi-billionaires <laughs> and the Duke of Argyle as well, um, who owned estates, um, the, the Sutherlands owned estates of 1.2 million acres and the Argyles owned estates of 170,000 acres. So we can see the disparity there um, right from the start. But of course, a very small proportion of his £21,000 a year was actually free for Dufferin to use. Annual expenditure on the estate, including upkeep of the house, rates and taxes, as well as family burdens and jointures, swallowed up £21,009 per year, leaving him only £680 free or disposable income for Dufferin when he came into his majority. Unsurprisingly, at about this time, Dufferin described inheriting an Irish estate as a more melancholy, saddening employment can scarcely be conceived. Um, Dufferin was expressing, I think, there, the disjuncture between his imagined construct, his mental image of Irish landlordism with the situation he had found in, on the ground in the 12 months he had had primary responsibility for his property. Already, he had diagnosed the economic and social structures hemming Irish landlordism as implacable, or in his word, insurmountable. This does not appear to have prevented him from making an effort to reform and restructure his estates, however. This, um, indeed, he had this huge emphasis on improvement um, throughout his life, which was a key part of his personal and political identity as an improving liberal Irish landlord. And that was very much informed by the actions of uh, other improving Whig liberal landlords like his friends, the Argyles and the Sutherlands. For Dufferin, a key part of the duty and identity of a landlord was improvement with a capital I. Um, so in other words, economic improvement, but also moral and social improvement too. 
Um, and he was he was disappointed by the lack of zeal demonstrated by his fellow Irish landlords in general, often comparing them unfavourably to their English and Scottish counterparts. So as an idealistic young graduate, his head stuffed with a classical education and peppered with the latest thoughts on political economy, Dufferin was burning to begin the management of the Clan de Boy estates anew. With this in mind, between 1847 and 1848, he visited every tenant on his land. As he said, I have passed whole days among the bogs. To gain a first-hand view of conditions on his estate under the shadow of the famine and formulate a comprehensive plan of improvements. His estates offered significant potential with good soil and other investment opportunities. Dufferin would attempt to develop these, but both his timing and the financial limitations he was struggling with precluded them from becoming an immediate economic success. Of course, he was undertaking his review under the cloud of the economic catastrophe um, and, and, and political and, and human tragedy of the Great Irish Famine as it devastated rural Ireland. At Clandy Boy, conditions were relatively stable in, in relative terms to other parts uh, of Ireland, I should say, um, in part due to the availability of alternative employment in the area, but also because the reliance on the potato was not so absolute. This did not mean that um, distressing poverty and increasing rent arrears were not in evidence, but compared to what Dufferin had seen during a visit to Skibbereen in 1847, the Clandy Boy tenantry were relatively well supported. He was privately highly critical of the lack of effort of other Irish landlords, particularly those who resorted to large scale eviction programmes during and just after uh, the Great Famine. His fear was that this abdication of responsibility and the suffering which ensued would lead to what he called uh, the re a repetition of the horrors of the 1878 rebellion. Demonstrating the way in which he linked in his own mind good landlordism with good governance, i.e. British governance uh, in this period. Um, but also his fear of the inherently rebellious nature of the Irish, a fear shared by his peers in the British government. Dufferin was never under any illusion about the precarious nature of the Irish rural economy, even in County Down, close to the booming textile industries of Belfast. As well as rent remissions then, um, during the famine, um, Dufferin gave substantial um, rent rebates or remissions uh, to his tenants. He also established um, a number of employment projects uh, to keep uh, his tenants uh, afloat. Um, he improved the domain, um, worked on, on roads um, and paths, um, but also, I suppose, with one eye to adding long-term value to his estate, um, and, and kind of consolidating uh, his legacy, presumably hoping that the combined costs of those rent um, remissions and improvements of just over £78,000 would be reflected in future land values. He was in these early years almost recklessly generous uh, to his tenantry. One of his first acts as I said, when he reached his majority, was to give a general rent remission uh, amounting to just over £2,000 a year. This is on top of £2,000 a year worth of um, arrears as well. But in addition, he was consistently unwilling to engage in any acrimonious debates without going tenants as to the value of their improvements, as per the custom in Ulster, leading to astonishing payouts to some individual tenants the highest I could find being £18,000 uh, in one case. So obviously the, the big question here is, why did Dufferin manage his estate <laughs> in this financially unsustainable and potentially ruinous way? Um, and it's a question I'm very interested in. Why, how can we explain the apparent irrationality um, of, of, the, of uh, the policies um, of some Irish landlords at this time? And it was a question that his own land agents, his friends and family were asking him with increasing urgency as well. The answer lies, I think, in two parts. First, as revisionist histories of rural and agricultural Ireland have suggested, Irish land was generally under rented in the post-famine period. 
Um, William Vaughan has demonstrated that rents lagged behind the value of agricultural outputs and profits from the 1850s. And of course, in, in the general scheme of things, uh, most Irish landlords didn't invest in permanent improvements like Dufferin did, um, which was left to tenants. Um, but they, but generally, rents tend, were fairly depressed um, as a kind of quid pro quo. Um, so there's a number of reasons why rents were so low, and Dufferin was by no means alone in tolerating uh, low rents, although it's perhaps a bit more unusual in Ulster. Um, but the second part of the answer, I think, lies in Dufferin's construction of his own Irish identity. He aspired to an imagined ideal of a good Irish landlord, resident on his estates and investing on them, treating his tenantry fairly so that he could be deserving of their loyalty and deserving of his own elevated and privileged position. He wanted, in fact, to practically articulate his qualities as a liberal politician and landowner and to set that example of good governance just as the cloud of hostility hanging over Irish landlords darkened in the wake of the Irish famine never again to clear. So how much did it all cost? Sorry about this slide. It's I like this kind of slide but it's obviously kind of horrifying as well. Um, so I, I have um, fond memories, if that's the word, of sitting in the reading room at Crony, uh, combing through the financial records of uh, the estate under the first Marquis and literally kind of getting a hot flush of stress <laughs> as I read the accumulation of debt and the, the sheer scale of the financial disaster. Um, it's an emotional space, the reading room at Crony. And I think the scale of Dufferin's accumulated indebtedness does make frightening reading if you take it over, over the decades. Obviously, from Dufferin's perspective, it's much more incremental than this, which might be the totals are terrifying, but maybe, you know, we never see the totals until the end. So between 1848 um, and 1862, he borrowed a total of £131,000. Two years later, in 1864, his accountant reported that his total debt um, then consisted of £100,000 of English loans, £75,000 um, of Irish loans, and interest of nearly £8,000 uh, per year. So in other words, two years within two years, he'd increased that total debt from 131 to roughly £175,000. This meant that the interest payments on the debt alone swallowed um, a huge proportion of Dufferin's annual income. Um, he was unable to slow his spiral into debt, and between 1862 and 1871, he borrowed a further £192,500, um, although he did claim that at least £150,000 of that was spent directly on estate uh, improvements. By the late 1860s, thanks to repeated warnings from his managers, who um, can only assume their hair was turning grey quicker than it should have, Dufferin had come finally to recognise the gravity of his financial situation, and he began a decade-long process of retrenchment, principally by selling off assets to keep his head above water. So this included the sale of smaller properties um, on, on the Clandy Boy estate, uh, estates in County Down, um, but also his house, number eight, Grosvenor Square in London, for £9,000. Um, and um, the gradual sale of shares in share investments worth £114,000 um, between 1847 and 1842. Um, so he's kind of, he's, he's selling off bits and pieces to try and meet the pressure um, that the debt um, was was applying to him. So, so, so just a reminder that his annual income was about twenty thousand pounds, and his debt was sort of towering at close to two hundred thousand um, pounds. Not a sustainable model, even um, by Irish landed um, standards. Um, now, Dufferin was not alone among the landed classes, as I've hinted, uh, either in Ireland or Britain, in facing financial instability and decline. Even the wealthiest families would use their landed assets to leverage credit, the other word for debt, 
and whole generations could find themselves obliged to retrench uh, to clear to clear that debt. So he he th this is a kind of a normal. The scale of Dufferin's borrowing is extreme, but it's a normal part of landed life uh, in this period in Ireland and uh, in Britain. The problem really can be defined in two ways. First, uh, a stagnant or falling income, and secondly, increased expenditure. Dufferin faced both. So take income first. As I said, when he inherited the estate, the annual income he received was around about £21,700. But as uh, the bulk of that was quickly swallowed by essential expenditure. Unlike many a canny and impoverished landlord before him, Dufferin failed to marry money as well. His wife, Harriet Hamilton, was a happy choice and an essential prop to his career. And she came from a county down family of proud heritage, but only modest means and didn't bring with her a kind of injection of cash and um, that might have tip the balance uh, financially in Dufferin's favour. But what about expenditure? So the figure of the profligate and extravagant Irish landlord was well established in satire long before Dufferin, um, and he did match some aspects of the stereotype. He was improving um, his big house, he was having an ornamental garden and landscaping designed by fashionable uh, artists, he kept carriages, he subscribed to numerous clubs in Belfast, Dublin and London. And the cost of maintaining the establishment in County Down alongside a London operation with some expensive hobbies thrown in, yachting, um, all that quickly outstripped his rental role. So why did he spend in this way, which seems, I guess the word you'd use is perhaps reckless. Um, or, or potentially um, irrational. Now, it's fair to say to him that the largest proportion of his expenditure was made with a pragmatic eye to future profit. So in other words, and, and this was the very much the common dogma at the time, which was land was the safest possible investment you could make in Victorian society. So anything that, um, that constituted his investment in his estates, um, whether that was road building, um, kind of uh, agricultural improvements, um, the development of, of, of Helen's Bay, um, they're expensive, um, but seen as a sensible financial strategy because any money put into the estates would, it was hoped, come back in the form of increased rentals and other forms uh, of income. Um, for Dufferin, this included the classic landed investment tactic of railway building <laughs> and the land sales to accommodate that. He'd initially been wary of a railway running across his estate on aesthetic grounds, but was converted by the long term economic prospect of being connected into the heart of Belfast. Partly as a result, from the early 1860s, he began to develop a small seaside town uh, on his estate and negotiated an expansion of railway operations at Helen's Bay Station, um, which um, was one of the most remarkable train stations in Ireland, I'm sure we can all uh, agree. And he began investing heavily in his vision of new homes for gentlemen uh, in the seaside town. He began by constructing a sea wall and esplanade and then commenced on suitable residential properties until the financial pressures simply became too great. He simply ran out uh, of money. Overall, he calculated that he had spent, and I quote, something like £150,000, <laughs> um, expenditure that he was never able to recoup. Um, the timing was wrong, the debt was too expensive, and instead he was left with all their cost, um, but none of their benefits, uh, all funded by increasingly expensive credit. The, I think the perilous economic circumstances of mid 19th century Ireland, I think, conspired against financial discipline on the Clandy Boy estates. He wanted to be a popular, improving landlord, and he took his political career very seriously on a, on a local level and also uh, at Westminster. And politics at the time, of course, cost money. 
Um, so that completely, his desires there completely overwhelmed the financial constraints of his inheritance. Um, and then he was also um, um, embattled um, by a hostile economic context uh, in Ireland. He attempted to spend his way to economic security through the development of his land, but this goal was never achieved. Although the trend for diversi diversifying landed estates into industry and finance was a common and often successful method of managing a landed fortune, Dufferin missed out on this by a combination of unlucky timing, uh, so the impact of the Great Famine and the agricultural depression of the 1860s being the most important there, but also as well as his failure to recognise the essential restrictions the relative smallness of estate, his estate created. I mean, this, the shame is he should have really been born the Duke of Argyll and it would have been fine. Um, economies of scale were just not possible on Clandeboy and Dufferin lacked the sort of cash reserves required to soak up the major investments and losses. The consequences would come home to roost in the early 1870s. So Dufferin's um, most pressing financial problem was the management of his ever increasing burden of debt, which <laughs> when it becomes so big, it sort of takes on a life of its own, essentially, and drives all the sort of financial decision making. Um, so that debt might have remained manageable, if not for the impact of economic and political downturns for Irish landlords from the 1860s. Um, Dufferin had borrowed very heavily by 1868, as we've seen, mortgaging his properties to a total of 43 different creditors, some individual and some institutional, like banks, uh, for example. But by far the largest of his creditors was John Mulholland, later Lord Dunleith, the outrageously successful Belfast textiles magnate. These mortgages were regularly renewed and extended by Dufferin until the early 1870s, when John Mulholland began to tighten the screws. Um, so Dufferin was attempting to renegotiate um, the, the mortgage uh, with Mulholland, um, and um, Mulholland was refusing to grant an extension below an interest rate of 5%, um, which was um, it had been at 4%, um, but 5% was just the, the tipping point for Dufferin. And this really represented financial Armageddon for him. The auditor's report for 1871 to 2 laid out the difficulties in stark terms. The total rental for that year was only was £19,800, but Dufferin's debts towered over that and he was struggling even to pay the interest on his loans. Um, when his agent totted up the total debt in 1873, it comes to the heart-stopping figure of nearly £300,000, um, with, as you see there, £120,000 of that owed to Mulholland. Um, so um, in early 1874, his agent wrote to Dufferin that the year's income would be £21,500, but the interest payments would immediately claim Fourteen and a half thousand pounds of that, with the rest of the essential expenditure taking into account, Dufferin in 1874 would have 153 pounds to live on. Unlike, well, like many indebted landowners, Dufferin was struggling to renegotiate his debts when they fell due. So some of his creditors were simply refusing um, to to renew um, their their mortgages and were calling in the money. Um, and um, alongside that, essentially, because he couldn't find new creditors and the scale of the debt was so enormous, there was really no op other option but land sales. So in a joint memorandum written in November 1875, Dufferin's advisors spelt out plainly that in order to clear these debts and be left with a suitable income, major land sales and a financial reconstruction would be required. And even then, the resulting income would only be enough to support a moderate domestic operation at Clandeboy with nothing left over for London. But of course, it's one thing to say land sales must take place, but quite another to deliver them. And the sale of Irish land in a difficult market at a time of economic depression was no simple task. Um, 
he was, and that is despite the operation of the Encumbered Estates Act, which had kind of been put in place to, to kind of keep the land market fluid. And um, Dufferin was also keenly aware of the pressure on him as the man who was proposing to sell his family's patrimony. It was difficult to offer another interpretation aside from failure. He was keenly aware of the reputational damage public land sales might have. He wrote to his agent, it would be very disagreeable if a report got abroad that I was getting rid of the whole property because I was ruined. But was Dufferin truly ruined? Despite the major land sales required, he wasn't ruined by the end of the 1870s. His and his family's long-term capital underpinning was severely weakened, but Clandy Boy was still a significant Ulster property and his imperial and diplomatic career secured his reputation and position. So as with most Irish land sales in this period, the actual process was slow and really fraught with difficulty. Uh, Dufferin calculated in 1877 um, that if they could achieve 28 years purchase on the estate, that means uh, taking the annual income from the estate and time, you know, um, uh, times in that by 28, um, you could get the, a, a kind of a sensible um, sale figure. Um, he calculated that they could realise £540,000 from the sale, um, but his agent took a much more realistic view, <laughs> uh, suggesting that 25 years purchase was more likely and that from a verified rental of £12,000 per annum, they could expect to make about £315,000 uh, from a sale. Now, his ideal scenario was that they could find a private purchaser for the whole of the property. And for this, he'd have been happy to drop his overall price, but it was not to be. Piece by piece, land sales were made by, between 1875 and 1878. And although Dufferin's crushing debts were cleared, it was at the future cost of a much reduced base of land and capital. Although fairly direct and unsentimental in his letters about the sales to his agent, Dufferin was clearly very disappointed and anxious about these sales. He indulged in these more, more despondent reflections when writing to his best friend, uh, the eighth Duke of Argyll. And I've taken a quote um, from there. Um, and he talks in this, I'll, I'll not read it out because it's, it's there on the screen, but he talks about a sense of bitter injustice. Um, and, and that comes from the sense that, you know, he, he tried to do his duty by his tenantry only too liberally. Um, and they are now well uh, protected. But he feels like that £150,000 of improvements um, has essentially just had to be left behind. Um, with no time to recoup the advantage um, themselves. And in this quote is, is, the, is the famous, much quoted um, phrase, uh, much quoted by Irish historians, that an Irish state is like a sponge and an Irish landlord never so rich as when he is rid of his property. But as he says in the end, it will be in many ways a great pain to part with this possession, which has been for nearly 300 years in my family, and I've done so much um, to embellish. And at the end, there's this kind of cri de coeur that, that, that really there's, there's almost like the beginning of the end or the end of the, of the Anglo-Irish class uh, in, in County Down. And this, this was a common cry from Irish landlords between the 1840s and the 1920s. But there's little really in this assessment of addressing his personal responsibility for the parlous state of his finances. Perhaps as early as 1847, he was aware his income um, would never be able to keep pace with his social and political ambitions. And the Great Famine and Agricultural Depression uh, encouraged maybe a fatalistic approach um, to financial matters. In his mind, circumstances had conspired against him and it's not surprising that he would come to this conclusion. It was a, a common one uh, amongst his class in Ireland and uh, indeed Britain. So I'll just finish with a few um, concluding remarks <laughs> on that happy note. Um, so I think we can see that over the course of the 19th century, the deteriorating reputation of Irish landlords generally became an increasing source of political weakness, undermining their power and influence in both Ireland and in Britain. 
Uh, that is Irish landlords reputations at Westminster. <laughs> Even before the catastrophe of the Great Irish Famine, some commentators saw Irish landlords as already discredited as a class and their responses to the crisis years further established negative perceptions, both in public uh, opinion generally, but also, as I say, at Westminster, even amongst the um, Conservatives, their kind of natural party. <coughs> but um, um, the law was not keeping up with fluctuating reputations. The law still gave landlords um, great power over their properties and tenants, as well as in politics and in Parliament. Their power rested on what was in the mid-19th century still a relatively deferential and paternalistic rural society. But that advantage was undercut both financially and culturally by the responsibilities um, landed paternalism imposed back on the landlords, that unspoken contract which demanded a return of support for tenants when times were bad in exchange for the loyalty uh, of those tenants. And times were frequently bad, even in industrialising Ulster. Dufferin took both sides of the reputational coin extremely seriously, but was constrained by tough financial realities. Um, he was also constrained by a, a growing shift away from that traditional social deference um, of, of, of the tenantry and by the hostile political climate as well. Um, Dufferin, and he's interesting because he constructed a particular kind of Irishness, utilising definitions of property and the heritable principle. And it's, it's, it's especially interesting given that from the early 1870s, he spent most of his time abroad um, serving in the courts of Europe or in Canada or India and, and his, in his other appointments. So there's, there's a period of perhaps two, 25 years or so where he was actually rarely home to be at Clandy Boy uh, as he moved from appointment to, to appointment. Um, and that maybe that plays a part in why he was so influenced by this idea of inheritance, of family traits, that Sheridanish uh, inheritance. Um, and perhaps Dufferin took this to um, extremes, uh, a result of the insecurity or his his what the what he felt of as his insecurity of his religious, social, and political position. Um, how far Dufferin's ideal of the Irish landlord matched the realities of his experience uh, as a landlord. Um, you can see the disjuncture between the construction and the experience very clearly. Dufferin was continually disappointed by the widening gap between his experiences and his ideals. He held a very positive image of what Irish landlords could be close to his heart. Um, he emphasised a more romantic persona where the spirit of generosity paternalism and deference were as central to landlordism as a sound head for figures. Dufferin's most important influences were popular literature and European romanticism. Um, so um, Sir Walter Scott was his um, favourite author. It's unsurprising that when in 1847 and he reached his majority and he started to throw himself into this role of uh, Irish landlord, he was both shocked and um, disappointed. The very select social circles he moved in, the royal court, the great Whig landed families, shaped his expectations as to his lifestyle, but the income generated by Clandy Boy fell far short in meeting the cost of these, along with many other experiences which fell far short of his expectations. And I'll leave it there, if I may. <laughs>